Good morning, Jennifer. How are you? I am great. It's good to see you, Adrian. <laughs> Great to see you too. I have been super excited about this podcast. We made it happen. You know, I just adore everything that you do. You are such a huge inspiration. I'm gonna, there's so many words I can use to describe you, but you're such a huge inspiration to women and future leaders, women that are, you know, sort of in transition, any age, any stage, you have literally moved mountains. And yes, you know why I'm saying moved mountains. <laughs> why don't you share with your audi or our audience where uh, where you are today? So I'm actually at the, it's called CTAC conference, which entrepreneur conference in Banff, Alberta. And it's, you know, playing with the sun coming over the mountains in front of me. We're going to see that happen through the podcast. Uh, but it's a beautiful place to be for self care. That's for sure. <laughs> I love that. Well, maybe at the end we'll like turn and see your beautiful view right now. So Jennifer, 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 I have a million questions for you. I know, we don't have all day, although I think we could probably take all day. Can you tell our audience just a little bit about yourself, maybe personally, before we get into all the fun things that you do as a woman of impact? Sure. You know, Agent, I think usually when I get this question, the biggest part is um, actually even how you know me, right, through this beautiful business community. All of this started uh, about, I guess it would be 16 years ago now, I found myself as a single mom, two little girls, small town Alberta, and like every good entrepreneur, there was a reason for, um, I couldn't go back to the corporate world, I had to do something where I had more control and flexibility over my life. And, and those two girls are a lot about uh, our, our little three pack that we are says a lot to who I am and what my weeks look like. A lot of basketball on weekends and then work during the week with my team at Magna. Uh, so in that process, I started Magna Engineering. It would be seven years ago now. And I refer to it as my third child. <laughs> so just another part. That. Yeah, and that's, I think that most entrepreneurs feel that way. It's, I was talking to someone last night about I've always valued family. And part of it's probably because of the girls and I kind of having this really close relationship. But Magna is the other member of the family. And so we can't do things that sacrifice the family. We can't do things just for Magna that sacrifice the family. But also as a family, we make decisions to support Magna because it's actually part of everything that we do. And yeah, it's, you know, I live in a beautiful province, the beautiful mountains and lakes. So a lot of the time outside of work is spent enjoying the nature uh, that we have out in Alberta. So that's, that's like so in a nutshell. I think we'll learn a little bit more as we go through this with you, Agent. Absolutely. 100%. So hats off to you as a single mom. I was a single mom for many years and an entrepreneur. And you brought up such a beautiful way to sort of give that, you know, third child space in all of the family's life, right? Because, you know, I, again, I had three boys at the time and quite little. How old are your girls, if you don't mind me asking? You don't have to say well, that. Now they're yeah, now they're 16 and 13. And that's actually how I arranged it. Is I started when I was pregnant with a 13 year old uh, and the 16 year old was three. So it, you kind of, that's the whole journey. <laughs> that is the whole journey. They're almost twinning. But what I was going to say to you too is that, you know, as a, as a woman and as a single mom, the things mm -hmm. that we juggle, it's, it's just insane. And a lot of people always ask me, how do you do it? Like, you know, they've got one child or they've got two and they've got help and they've got nannies or partners or whatever. And my answer, I, oh, I always struggle with that answer. So I'm going to ask you the question, but I always say that Nike took my answer and, you know, made a multi trillion dollar <laughs> company out of it. You just do it, right? Just mm -hmm. do it. So mm -hmm. How do you do it? Like how, so if somebody that is a single mom and has a baby on the hip or a baby in the belly or three kids, what would be your tips or how did you do it? Like, that's what I want to know. Cause you're, you've been really successful at doing it and the way that you phrased it. I love it. Love it. Well, you know, Adrian, I was it's kind of too prom. So the first part is you nailed it. 
The grit building that comes with being a single parent. Uh, I remember years ago hanging out with a group of moms that were that were single moms, and we'd kind of found each other, and it was our unique thing is finding freedom and space together. Love and that. one of them was in a serious relationship. She'd found, you know, like a second relationship. And I'd made this comment to her. I kind of looked over her and I said, oh, except for you, you're, in a, you're not a single mom anymore. And she's like, oh, like because you, you wear this single mom with a bit of a badge of honor because of the grit that it builds, because of what it means that you've you've had to do. Um, and you do take on this. You, you just you just do it. And it creates this strength, the superpower that allows you to get into a work environment when you're dealing with risk and opportunity choices. You have learned to be decisive. You have learned to live with the consequences one way or the other. Sometimes it works. Sometimes you need to pivot. It, and, and so it actually builds some really great qualities for a business leader. And um, the second part of that is I have always been someone who is selfish about self-care like selfish. Mm. I always have a spot in my life where I make a latte or coffee and sit and look out the window or just actually was making coffees for my kids when they were tiny, tiny. They'd be in a high chair with their little steam milk and I'd be sitting beside them with the coffee. Oh, <laughs> and, you. and it's just, you have to build that energy somewhere. So I've been pretty selfish about health, self-care, even if it's just in those little moments, but it's, made it possible to have the energy I need for everything else. And you know what, you touched on it perfectly. I, you know, and I'm the same. I would almost take it one step further and I don't think it's selfish. I think it's necessary, <laughs> you know? And a lot of times we so, we put as women and as mothers, we put everybody else first. And you know, there's a lot of times, and I'm sure you've been down this path where you kind of have to remind yourself like, no, I, I used to, um, Somebody very smart told me once, you know, when you're traveling and the stewardess or steward gets on the, the uh, intercom and says, you know, put on your mask first if you're traveling with little ones. And I'm like, absolutely not. Like, that is just absurd. And then somebody sort of referred that back and said, it's sort of like being a single parent or a parent in general or maybe even just a human in general, it's put your mask on first, right? Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. can be good to take care of your whole team and your kids and everything else. So I love the fact that you mm -hmm. make time for yourself. I've always been the same way. And it's funny, it's something silly, same with the coffee thing. But in the morning, I don't know, I like to shower and get ready. That's always been my thing. Yeah. I don't do it for anybody else. I don't do it to impress anybody. It's for me. It's my time. I listen to a podcast. I listen to music. I listen to silence. You know, it depends on the moment that we are in, but it is so incredibly necessary. So I love the fact that you started off sort of out of the gate saying, you need to look after you. That is mm -hmm. brilliant, 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 brilliant. And then also surrounding yourself with, and again, we'll chat about how you and I met, surrounding yourself with a network of like-minded women. They don't have to be in the same industry. They don't have to be entrepreneurs. It's just what support you need. And if you needed that single mom vibe, then that's what you needed. And you created that for yourself. That's brilliant. Was that sort of a lifesaver, do you think, for you? Because I think when people say, and I love the badge of honor, I'm the same, I still talk about it because it really is very, very different than yes. having a partner's help, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, emotionally, spiritually, physically, financially, every which way, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, you probably wear that badge of armor or of honor, um, but it's also so important to remember, even if you're with somebody else or down the road, that you got through that. Like, you're like, I did, I did that. And like you said, you took learning experiences from that. That is so brilliant. And so you brought sort of your strength, your leadership, your fearlessness, your resilience into what you're doing today. So can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, and I think that like you were, you were asking around, um, how I knew that I needed it. And it was really early on, just we all have different circumstances of what got us into that situation of being single parents sure. too. Um, and I used to have this discussion around, there are certain things that were hard about being a single parent. And it was this Friday night discussion. For some reason, it seems that if my girls weren't staying with me for some reason on a Friday night, 
um, all the other families in town were all together having that, de you know, decompressing night on Friday night. And it started as, well, who else is in this situation right now? that would understand how I feel. And that's kind of where that kind of group of single moms grew out of it. It was just like, okay, who am I gonna ask to do something on Friday night? Okay, all these other single parents that are, are having this hard time. And and that speaks to the whole mentoring in visit, like how we met Adrian, right? Is trying to find people at any point in time that have either are on the journey with you that understand the journey you're going to be on or um or even being able to give back to those that are just getting started out and like i love to give uh my time a couple minutes to to young single parents and reminding them that you need to find freedom really early and it's hard to be away from our children but i had some really good time on those friday nights we got you know us yeah, like 35 years old and doing odd things like meetups. It was like, kick the can, glow in the dark, kick the can in the park with a bunch of 30 year olds. And, I was like, <laughs> and it was probably, like you said, the best time, right? Yeah, like it's, it's this random time. And so same thing with business, working with my network and my mentors is every once in a while being able to like, well, have you tried this? And I'm like, oh, that is terrifying. And like, trust me, I know it sounds terrifying, but I've been there. I've done that. Mm -hmm. These were the successes I found out of it. So just the importance of finding people that are, I, I do like to talk about those, like, I'm sure Adrian, you've talked to a number of leaders, um, the three types of mentors, like you've got the ones that are ahead of you, you've got the ones that are walking with you, and then you've got those ones that you're leading, and all three of them you're getting um, mm. different things from, but all necessary things. So it's just trying to build like-minded, but also people that you can learn from who are maybe slightly different spot than you are, but yeah. I love that. But it's all about, I keep going back to sort of your main thing. And the way that I've built every single business is through connections and creating relationships. And I feel like what you're saying, and we haven't even touched on uh, your uh, professional success, but I feel like that's sort of your main thing is have your network of close people and mm -hmm. people that can count on you and people you can count on and throw ideas around. It is so important because I remember back in the day where people and women especially held a lot of things very close to their chest and they didn't share because it was all about climbing that ladder and it was mm -hmm. about you know getting ahead alone. And now together, we are so much stronger. And I love the fact that how busy you are, and it's the same with myself and many people that we know, Rose included, is we share our experience and our knowledge because we want you to do better. We mm -hmm. want people to do better. And that is so beautiful. Do you find that as a personal and professional um, goal, but also sort of as I almost see it almost like a legacy that you're leaving for your girls too. Yeah. You know, I was asking this. So at this conference that I'm at now, um, it's, it's meant to be for young entrepreneurs, it's an entrepreneur to CEO. So a lot of inventors and young entrepreneurs in the room mm. mixed with a bunch of us. I, I get to be a mentor this year, which is really exciting. And there was a couple of family businesses that were talking last night. And it's this lovely woman. She's 75 years old and her children are presenting on their business now. And I was talking to her about um, our children and my 16 year old has full plans to be the CEO and take over one day. And I, and, and I was asking her about it. Yeah. And she was like, well, let them go learn elsewhere and come back to you. Mm. And because I, I, that's what her children did. And I go, well, how did they come back? Like, obviously, you know, growing up with a single mom who's working can be really hard when you're gone or you're doing a lot of um, traveling and different kinds of committing yourself to your business. So to have your children still really enjoy being part of that with you, um, I always worry about it. But I had gotten some good advice years ago that said, invite them in. So when we, you know, do Christmas presents for clients, my children come in and do the stamping, right? Like lick the stamp, get it on the envelope, put it out. Um, when we have different events at work that are family friendly, you know, everyone in the office knows the girls. So it's kind of a, a good way to kind of keep them involved in it. Right. So, so yeah, it's been great. I love that. And, you know, I'll even take it one step further because my kids, I mean, I have four boys. 
Mm -hmm. um, and I have a few different businesses, but I've always said to them, you know, if you ever, like I leave it open as opposed to your place in the world is to take yeah. over, you know, the business or you're expected to, because I feel that in their sort of growth. So my kids are between 15 and 26. So okay. I feel like if you sort of tell them this is their place in the world, you're going to get pushback from kind of like, mm -hmm. well, probably 11 and 12 onwards, you get this pushback. But like she said, they come back around. And mm -hmm. I've always wanted my kids to do, and I've always said this, do what makes you happy because then it doesn't become work. It's like, I love what I do. Like talking to you to me is a gift and being able to influence through sharing stories and whatnot others is just, it's a huge gift. But nevertheless, just sorry to go back to uh, what I was saying is, you know, they'll go and they, oh, I'm never going to do what you do. I'm not, you know, I'm going to, and they, they feel like they want this independence, but as soon as they get out there and they see what is out there, look, they might find their thing. My oldest one was so undecided and, and found something now. Do I think it's yeah. his forever thing? Absolutely not. My second one, who's 23, going to be 24, same thing, went out and was trying to find his way. He's into um, hockey, just for example, high level hockey. And three, four years he's come to us, you know, I really want to buy a team. I want to be, you know, this, I want to do that. I said, same as what oh. advice that you got from your, um, uh, the lady that you met. I was like, go and coach. I kept pushing him out. And this is like year four now. And he just bought his own hockey team. So my point is, I think both are good. Like, yes. Yeah. And so trust me, it has not been an easy road, but <laughs> you know, but my thing is it's like, they're going to find their way. And I mm -hmm. love the fact that she's telling you just leave it open to them. And you seem yes. like that type of person where you share and they know that they can come to you, but they also kind of have to find their independence. I'm sure you're in the fun stages like I was and my last one is coming up too. But you know what, knock on wood, they're all good. It sounds like you've got yours in yeah. some organized sports too, which to me is one of the number one things. I know we're going, mm -hmm. we're supposed to be talking about business and everything, but last <laughs> thing is the fact that you have them in organized sports. Don't you find that so incredible for their character and their teaching women in sports i mean phenomenal yeah you know and i one of the things we always discuss too is i'm you found this too having multiples is the two girls are so different but um the things that they've learned on the team being on the team has like it's challenged them out of their different places. Like the, I, I love that the girls get to support each other and they support each other in different ways. The one of them is just my oldest is absolutely brilliant. Um, the line actually that my, my youngest and I were talking last year, she was writing a letter about a hero and she decided to write it about her sister. Okay, you're and, me cry my eyelashes <laughs> off. That is beautiful. And then we'll finish it with after because she said, well, mom, you know, because I mean, I'm an engineer, so, you know, we're all good at math over here. So she said, yeah, it would seem that Anna got all of your brains and dad's and I got what was left over. And I was like, oh, honey, no. And she goes, it's okay, mom, because I got all your kindness and dad's kindness and Anna got what was left over. And it was this laughter because the two of them are so different. And when they're on team sports, it's interesting to see it. So on the court, my oldest one that's always like thinking about every move all the time. She's all about strategy and how she's doing on the team. And then the youngest, who's more the collaborator and the kind one in there, she's devastated if the team loses. It doesn't matter how good she played. You know, whereas the 16-year-old, she doesn't care how the team did overall. It's important that she did all the things she was supposed to do. And it's such an analogy to the business environment, to bringing ourselves to our teams, that everyone's different and, you know, everyone holds a different role. And so I love what team sports has done for the girls. I think for that, well, even for me, I was, I was a team sport person as a, as a child too. And okay. the idea that you, I think that the line that comes out of it is like a strong player wins games, but strong teams win championships. And 
And it's this, you, you know, there's lots of really good business advice around out there around how the, the team initiative can feel slow, but it'll get you farther kind of a thing. So mm-hmm. I love that about team sports for, for kids. Yeah, love- it was for me too. So a hundred percent. And, you know, number one, it keeps also keeps them busy. It keeps them active. <laughs> you know, you get to kind of meet their friends, the parents of the friends and whatnot. There's so many pluses. Um, I, I'm yeah. going to touch base on one thing you said about the the girls, and I love that. And having four, like any more than one, you know, is life changing, too crazy busy yeah. and anything after that, you're in survival mode. But it's and I'm a second child, so I get to say this. It's always that second child. But like you said, it is so incredibly important. And my second child's the one that bought the hockey team and is always the yeah. entrepreneur, the creative there you need all different types of people in a team just to yes. your point <laughs> in life and like professionally uh and i feel that you know them being able to see that so early on is so incredibly important and that was my message to my kids too i mean i had two players and i have two the two middle ones number two and three um were goalies which is the worst position on the team in my humble opinion but anyways for the parent anyways you're always sweating but anyhow and i was like it's not about you know keeping the little black thing out of the net or putting the little black thing into the net there's so many other lessons just be open to them and that's the message okay so that's our parenting advice i think you and i could go on and on and on and on and on but this really is about you and thank you for sharing so many important things about you and your family and the girls because the the dynamics like you talk about are so important that they're supportive and they see it you definitely don't want them to feel abandoned or feel like their second but i love the fact i'm still going back to the fact that you said it's sort of like my third child Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask you a really important question because people say this to me all the time and I'm like, okay, it is for me. People always say business is not personal. And I'm kind of like, okay, I know what they're trying to say, but it is personal. Like you said, you love it. You nurtured it Mm -hmm. from a baby, from an infant. What do you think about that comment? Business is not personal. So you, you asked me in the beginning, I had just recently won this, um, really super honored to win this award about influential women in business. And uh, the comment that I got asked was very similar to this, right? Like, what does it mean to be a female leader? And um, I'm always pushing back. I'm like, well, you know, um, using the term female leader means we're not quite there yet, but it's this personal comment that you're talking about. For me, the future of leadership is this unite, uh, uniting of what we used to call male leadership, but we're now calling female leadership. Mm-hmm. And it's putting value on bringing your true self to work. And that includes being emotional at work. Now, <laughs> I joke always says it. You guys, you, guys, you gotta keep it together. <laughs> um, yes. But it's about bringing, really respecting and valuing, bringing our full personal emotional selves to work. It is about respecting relationship driven type of client relationships, which comes along with a personal story, really understanding people where they're at and why they might have needs for what it is that we're bringing to the table from a business perspective. Um, And really that kind of long term game. And then equally valuing that with what we might have called those more impersonal, you know, being risk takers, um, being, you know, driven to profits, those things like they're they're We don't want to lose those from the business. They're the things that keep the lights on. But it's this idea. I think there's just a really beautiful move in business to be to really understand the value of the bringing the personal story, the authenticity to the work environment, bringing it to our clients, to our team. So I put a lot of value on being ourselves at work. We even, you know, a lot of companies started the the check-in during COVID and mm-hmm. we were one of those every morning. And over That's time, beautiful. it was, and we it's kind of, it's moved to just once per week, or I should say twice per week. We do half an hour on a Tuesday check-in and then Thursday afternoon we do what we call as conversation and cocktails. And it's kind of a way for us to, to, to end the week together. But the intention is no work and that's it. And it's just... You don't know when you need to be personal at work. I, I always say it's kind of like healthcare. You know, you pass all the time, but every once in a while, you're like, I lost someone really important to me last weekend. And you, you wouldn't just say it in your daily work 
every day, you know, like you're doing your tasks every day, you wouldn't just tap your colleague on the shoulder maybe and say, this happened to me last weekend. But because of these spaces that we've created for people to be a bit more personal at work, they can share. And and that affects our whole work environment. You know, you're sitting beside someone all week who's not getting their work done or whatever, and you're getting frustrated with them. And if you knew that they were having a really hard time because they were going through something personally, it completely changes how we act as a team during that period of time, like how they're feeling might mean this is the week for me to step up. And then when I'm having a hard week personally, that's the week for them to step up and support me. So I truly believe curiosity, accountability, if we really want these things in our work environments, we have to have an element of personal or that freedom of being able to be ourselves at work. I love that. And you know, you touched on something, many important things, but nobody really knows what somebody else is going through Mm -hmm. unless you ask the questions and unless you give that safe space to talk. Mm -hmm. So I really do commend you for doing that for your team. I know there's so many other things that sets you apart from, you know, let's just say others, not that we're competing, but we're just talking about how wonderful you're doing. So can you just share what the award was? Um, Because I I, I do know what it is, but I'd love you to share uh, what the award was. And I'd like to also ask you, what sets you apart from your competitors? Like what makes you different? I, I think I know, but I'd love you to share. And now the beautiful sun is coming in. I don't know if you need to adjust. It looks great. I just don't know if you're okay with the sun in your your eyes. Or you can put your sunglasses on. We can both put our sunglasses on. I know. It was funny because I was thinking, like, just in the right time for you to ask me. I'm like, aside from this angelic presence that I am bringing to our guests. Exactly. Um, Yeah, let me just adjust it a little bit. Yeah, no worries. You go for it. Okay, let's do that. That's just just, just a little bit. There um, you go. Yeah. Down to the real world. Um, so, two things. This award was, um, it's five years they've been doing this and it's to celebrate, uh, it's a Calgary Influential Women in Business. And so the intention is very specific to who, which women in our industry as business leaders are helping other women. And that, that is a really important kind of aspect to the whole thing. So actually this conference that I'm doing here is a big part. I have to thank these guys uh, for supporting that award because I've been mentoring, being mentored and mentored in this space now for a couple of years. Um, so I really liked that. And that's the influential women in business part is they were really trying to find women in leadership who were looking to build up other women. So. Love that about it. Um, I guess the second part about it, your second question around what makes me different was probably kind of tied up in what I ended up telling during the, my award speech. And it actually, some of the lines showed up in the Herald, the Calgary Herald around it. And when I was first reading it, it was really fun. When I first read it, I was like, ooh, that's a little spicy. And um, so I was kind of just sharing the discussion around what it means to have these healthy workplaces that are diverse. And what I mean by healthy is it kind of your question, Adrian, around bringing personal, that personal side to work. I really believe that if we really want long-term, sustainable, successful businesses, we would be doing everything in our power to bring diversity to the work environment. And what came up out of that discussion is if we're not paying attention to these important qualities of our future leaders, we're not attracting diverse, we're a diverse workforce, right? Like, and and they go hand in hand. And so the gentleman was asking me, I said, I love engineers. Like I, I my company is a civil engineering company, but we're, we're over 50% women. So what happens in that scenario wow. is, yeah, I, I'm not living the, very traditional, thank you. Love I'm it. Living that very traditional, like I don't go to work every day and surrounded by men. My clients are all men. Um, but saying for engineers, what I love about engineers is we are taught and it's, it's part of our profession to be able to be wrong in a group of people who are against us, right? So, you know, everyone's like, well, you're wrong about this. And you're like, no, I feel very strongly about it. 
And it's a great trait in an engineer is they can just hold their ground regardless, right? They, they aren't being persuaded away from this is the safest way to do it. This is the, this would protect the environment. Um, but when you put them in a business context and you're asking them to think outside the box, try something different, evolve because we've evolved as a business community, it's a little tough because they're so used to doing, well, this is the way we've always done it. And it means that it's safe. And so I was saying that my industry makes me very unique because it's inherent to our profession to be cautious about evolving, to be cautious about trying new. Um, so I, I feel like that's what makes me kind of different. Like you were asking about who, what makes me yes. different. My oh, yes, absolutely. You know, being and able to bring two things together. So I love that. So do you, so obviously you're in a male dominated or sort of untraditional space. Yes. What was the pushback that you got when you came in? You're like, I'm here, I've arrived, I'm not leaving. These yes. are the things I'm doing and now look at you. So <laughs> any pushback, what was, what would be, what would you say was sort of your toughest spot if there was one? Can you share right. it? And what did you do to get over it? Um, two, I would say that there's two big ones that, uh, you know, there's the, the little tiny things through the way that, you know, you could kind of chalk up to microaggressions. But the two big ones were when I first got started, it took a long time for me to be able to use the term CEO. And the when we you know my young staff would be like, but aren't you the CEO? And I'm like, no, I'm the founder or I'm a, a, a director. And, and it came from this idea that I was working with all these like older male clients who were treating me a bit like a, a daughter or a granddaughter. And it, and it was, I could feel it. I was like, oh, okay, you're not seeing me as a peer. <laughs> this is yeah, really yeah, dumb. Like, hello. You know, okay. and it, and it would get in the way of me being able to perform the job I was performing. So it was a little bit easier for me just to like, not talk about this title as much. And then as Magna started to grow and we were over 20 people starting to have, you know, closer multi-million dollars of revenue, you know, I could start to see people, I could use the term CEO because it was like, oh, wow, you're like, you're like leading something really important. And it was like, I had to earn that. And it was always tough for me because I, I, I felt like I had to sacrifice that trust that, that, that a female leader can, can often bring to a relationship without even trying. Mm. I had to, to hold on to that. I had to be less. And then I had to earn that ability for them to see me as a peer. And I'm that hoping that's within yourself, right? That was within your, the sort of internal struggle you had, right? Because yes. of the way they were treating you. It's not that you couldn't have, like you said, exactly. but it's like exactly. you needed to take your time to sort of, if you call it, earn your title and your yes. space. That was, that was you though, right? That wasn't yes. anybody else. No, it, it was, was not. Yeah, and I think it's it's like that inherent problem solving. And, and when you talk a lot about these values, this collaboration relationship base, it means that even something as simple as the way I introduce myself or the title I give myself, I'm constantly considering when I'm working with a client or I'm working on a certain project. And we talk about it in our office a lot because engineers start with this title called engineer in training and you have it for four years. So you've gone through this really difficult engineering degree. <laughs> doing engineering and you've got in training on the back of your name until you're like 30. So yeah. I tend to call them designers. And it's really cause funny because these young engineers are like, but I'm an engineer in training. I'm like, ah. yeah. <laughs> the rest of the world, yeah. I know it. I don't like that, and, exactly. So, so that's the one component of it. And the second is really this discussion around relationship-based uh, decision-making. So right now we're in a position where we're doing a bit of shifts in Magna. Uh, I think we're just at that point where we've been around for seven years and we were kind of starting the ship, you know, you point a direction for the ship and then it kind of starts to waver off just a little bit. And in the last six months, we started to see that happen. And so we're doing a reshift, kind of really getting back to finding our, our North Star. And with that, we've got some clients that aren't going to come along with us. And, and we've identified that. And it's this difference between they're still operating in a world where, you know, profit schedule, this is what we, we have to do this. And and we we strayed from that when I started Magnet Engineering. It was, 
quality based and very specific client outcome based. And those things don't always align with the original budget or the original schedule. And I used to mm -hmm. always say, no one's going to remember if I did it on budget or on time, you know, 100 years from now when they're using my infrastructure, they're going to remember if I did a good job. And it's, it's yes. a different value set. And so I find it is a little tougher in that kind of more, um, let's just call it the way we used to do things type of environment, which were predominantly led by men. So we could call it that kind of way that male leadership used to, to work. Cause I know a lot of wonderful male leaders who have evolved uh, a lot through this process, but in engineering, it's a little slower. <laughs> um, so that's really the second part is, is kind of bringing a fresh new way to solve problems in a high risk environment. Cause engineering is a high risk environment. So sure. to look at a client and say, I'm going to try something we've never done before. These are the risks that could come out of it. Are you willing to walk this journey with me? It's like terrifying oh, <laughs> um, in the engineering space. But I, I find a lot easier to do when you've brought authenticity and you've been really honest and mm. you've brought your personal self to where this was my vision. This is my journey. This is why we're making these choices. The clients can get on, on board with that. You know, and if you're not sharing all that, and you're like, I'm going to try something new. Trust me. I'm like, ooh, <laughs> it's a tough yeah, position to like, put. Yeah, and you know, lots of people are going through what you're going through, but I want to, you know, applaud you for all the amazing things that you're doing, and that you're also sort of taking a risk and saying, well, there's clients that unfortunately are not going to take the journey. And I don't know, yeah. I think a lot of the decisions people do make, yes, they're, you know, let's just say old school. Some of them are really fear based because people do not, as humans, we're naturally, we don't love change. If we're comfortable with the way you've been doing things, we don't want to change it. Please, Jennifer, don't change it. But to grow, change and and to have innovation it needs to happen right and so i love the fact that you're saying you know i'm pivoting i'm i'm doing this i know i'm not going to make everybody happy i go back to apple i always use apple because i love apple I, we're a huge apple family and users and no i don't get paid <laughs> to say this but really i am <laughs> but they have something like a 2.8 percent um dissatisfaction rate so if you are going to lose some people along the way, it opens the door for growth, innovation, and other people that will love and see your vision and just be so on board. And it will also, I think, fuel you and your team for the growth that needs to happen. And I think that's, would I, would I be sort of on point? That's what yes. you're looking at? Oh, you, you, nailed, you nailed it exactly. Is that, if, and we, we've, we've all grown up with that, you know, um, the only way to innovate is to fail, right? And the only way to do that is to be able to fail well and fail safely. But that's terrifying. And like you're saying about change, change is that, that fear of change is like, but I don't want to fail at what I'm doing. And, and if you've done, uh, we last year had done a little work on change management. And, and I love the imagery of like, you come in from the old cliff, and then there's the new cliff on the other side, and you have to go through the valley of despair to get there. Oh, yes, the valley of despair. Yeah, yes. well, and I remember doing a, we were on a Zoom call with the team, uh, and I was using my trackpad to draw little stick people, and it was, it's, it's, it's now gone down in history as a very famous moment in Magna. Um, <laughs> where do you see each other? You know, little stick men hanging on to the initial old cliff who does not want to let go, right? Like, oh, my God. And then you're sitting in the bottom of the valley of despair. You're in the jungle and you can't see how this change is going to do any good whatsoever. Or are you the one on the other side who's lifting people out of the valley of despair and saying, it's so much better on this side. But the reality is we all have to go through that in change, right? And so it's just accepting that, okay, we're just in the valley of despair. That's fine. But we need to get through that to get to the thing that we all want, which is the new, better, evolved version of ourselves, of our companies, of our projects, of our families. Um, but it's helped me so much understanding that there's this value of change and you cannot get there without the value of despair. 
you cannot growth and innovation will not happen with it. I mean, you get to a certain point, of course, where if you want to take it to the next level, that's what has to happen. And and you're right. It is about taking a risk. But I think you're you're very clear in saying your clients are amazing. All of them, even the ones that maybe are not coming along for the ride. But don't is that what you feel sort of is going to get you to the next level with your amazing uh, company is taking a certain amount of risk failing. I mean, so many people, like you said, are terrified of failing. I always do this thing when I do my keynotes and I'm like, rejection is redirection. Failure is necessary. And everybody's like, what? No, it's not. I'm like, it is. You have to fail. And like you said, your, let's just call it mistakes or failures or whatever you'd like to say, they come with a big price tag. So there's people that have to believe in you. And failure Mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's all lost and whatever. There's, you know, hills and valleys and, you know, there's the valley of despair. I love that. I'm going to use that, by the way, the valley of despair. But that is where growth happens. That's where resilience happens. That's where new ideas are born. I love the valley of despair. Don't you? I do. And your mindset to say, I love this. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Well, and do you ask the question around how do you, you shore it up? Like the reality is um, successful businesses are not stumbling in the dark, right? So you, and I think you, you kind of were, you were talking about the idea that all is not lost. So when we go into this, especially because we're dealing with public safety, we, there's all sorts of things we have to shore up. We have to be redundant in certain areas. So we're like, oh, that failed. But thankfully, there was this fail safe to catch it, right? And, you know, okay, it costs some money or things, but, you know, we, we can't hurt the, the public. We can't hurt the environment. So no matter what we do, we need to have certain, you know, we have to shore up certain things. Cards for sure. Yeah. And someone was asking me this morning around how much I believe that luck is part of success. And there's lots of different views on this. And and I always say that you create, you can't create luck itself. Like really successful businesses always have luck. They get right time, right place, all these different kinds of things. You really, there is an element of luck, but you have to be in the right place for it to be that right time. And so you create these environments where luck can find you. And I feel like that's what happens when we're like trying to do something new or these innovations. You're like, oh, it worked. And I'm like, well, it doesn't just accidentally work. Yeah. It probably tried something, you know, it, it failed in this way. And then you found out something new and you're like, well, we're so lucky we found out that new thing. And I'm like, well, yes, but you put yourself in a position to try, you put yourself to be okay with the failure and the failure actually gave you a new direction that's potentially better. And that's often where it comes. It's being able to make decisions and pivots in that failure, you know, because that's, that's the growth is a little bit of failure gets you a better opportunity. Um, So, so it's kind of doing both. You're, you're not, you're not total wild west, um, but you're open to being able to see whatever's coming at you. So I love that. And, and that's where innovation happens. I mean, let's just call a spade a spade. You're an entrepreneur and were or are a single parent, you know that sometimes when your back is up against the wall, that's your best work. That Those are sometimes the most, for me anyways, and I know a lot of entrepreneurs, would you say that for you as well? That sometimes when you're sort of at that crossroads, that's where your best self shows up. Is there, would you agree with that? And is there something, I know you've got to go and we're almost wrapping up. I've got two more quick questions. But I'm curious, can, can you think of a time when you ha- were at that crossroads and you, your back was up against the wall and you were like, you know what, I've got to do this or, you know, this is going to happen and you sort of mitigate your, let's just say, failures and, yeah. you know, great things have happened. I mean, even just get, number one, getting your award, as well as you just taking that risk on you and the company mm-hmm. saying, I'm going to pivot. That to yes. me is like, it's, it, most people won't do it. Not, not even once in a lifetime. No. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. Cause you know, I, I try to think, I'm like, well, what did I do that was a like this? And I'm like, well, there's the moment. Right. And that is like this. Everything else after that moment feels like it takes way too long. Yeah, um, exactly. The moment. Absolutely. <laughs> exactly. I would say 
there has been a couple. Um, the hardest one is letting a client go purposefully. Like honestly, letting good employees go is also hard, you know, especially when you we are a fairly personal, we care a lot about each other. So when an employee doesn't have a fit, it feels extra hard, right? Because you're like, oh, I really like you. You just don't fit in this work environment, right? Yes. Um, I have been someone who's always believed that if someone's not working in my environment, I can't let them go fast enough because there's somewhere else that they need to be able to be them true, productive, amazing selves because they're not doing it here. So I'm actually pretty fast at employee decisions. Um, It's the client ones, I think, that have really been signs and Magna's story where I've I've had to come to a client and say, had an example, uh, it's actually a year ago almost now, to our amazing technology that is first of its kind in Canada. It's a new patent and technology that we have for for wastewater treatment. And we were going to take a bigger role in operations. And I was watching them really push back on us in a way that felt adversarial. And I I just, I, I set up a meeting, I get on the phone with them and I'm like, you know, this isn't working. And they're like, what? And I'm like, I know this is our first in the Canada. Like, I don't want to let go of any control on this. Trust me, this is a really hard decision to make, but we're not in a good collaborative relationship. And I can't take on more risk unless you're willing to walk that line with me. So I'm going to give it back to you. And you're going to be taking on the risk for the operations. And we're going to stand here and help you wherever we can, because it's really important to us that this doesn't fail. But... We're gonna have to we're gonna have to turn this project down, and it was our it's our baby, and we we are out there doing the testing, monitoring. We're, it's our science project, um, but it was a really hard decision, and my entire company was like, I can't believe you walked away from that, and I said, it is really important that you guys see that there is no situation that an adversarial client is something that we can accept ever. Mm. They can't treat you this way. They can't treat me this way. They can't even treat our projects this way. If they're not bought into what we're doing, we're not going to find success. So Mm. maybe this isn't the project that we find the success that we wanted. Maybe it's the next one. Thankfully, um, we've been able to at least be present for a lot of it. So it's it's been as good as it could be. Um, But it was it was big change for us. And now. I look back on that in my lessons learned confirmation bias. I don't know if I would have known when I started with them that they were the wrong client, but now they've taught me a lot about how I pick the next client that has a first in Canada uh, technology for Magna Engineering. I might be, yeah. I might change how I choose that client in the first place. So I love that. And the thing is too, do you put a lot of weight in? Because I think you do, because you said mm-hmm. everybody on your team was sort of surprised. Do yeah. you really listen to your gut? You know, people call it women's intuition, gut feeling for men's spidey sense. I mm-hmm. do. And I feel like that I, that was like you said about your moment, just yes. something physically felt wrong. And I actually saw, I saw a study that your gut, especially women, is attached to your brain. So if something physically doesn't feel right, it's not. It might not be what you're thinking, but was that what it was for you? Yes. And you know what, Adrian, this comes back to this discussion around, um, my line is always the the universe really likes me. Uh, And people are like, well, you're really lucky. I'm like, I'm not, but I'm okay with following my gut. I really am okay with it. I'm okay with a little bit of rejection. I'm okay with a little bit of failure. So I'm like, you know what? Oh, this feels right. Let's try it. You know, or this doesn't feel right. I think I'm going to take a step back. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and there there have been consequences from that. But when I follow my yeah, gut, I'm okay yeah. with them. Yes. And I, it's like I'm I'm better prepared to handle the consequences for good or for bad if I follow my gut. If I make a decision that's not in alignment with the way that I'm feeling, or you know, I haven't got that spidey sense, um, and it goes badly. Yeah. I am so mad at myself. <laughs> yeah, you know it. You know it. I, it's sort of like that hindsight, and I don't know if it comes with experience or with age, whatever it is. 
I, I looked back and I, I'm like, geez, if I would have listened, I knew something was off. Like I felt it and I didn't listen. And so now for decades, same, you know, whether you want to call it the universe, some people are like karma, whatever, luck, whatever you want to call it. But if you don't listen to yourself, your physical being, because we're all energy, I don't think you're serving yourself in the right way. So I love the fact that you make probably personal and uh, business decisions that way. I, again, it's not sound like, I don't mean to sound like uh, it's just a flighty decision, but you really, like you said, you take a step back and you analyze, why am I feeling like this? And then mm -hmm. obviously, you know, you put your business hat on and, you know, you weigh the pros and cons, but I love the fact that you listen to yourself and to your body because a lot of people don't, and they'll go after, let's say the client or the money or whatever, the projects that are not a good fit. And then they end up in a worse position having to detangle everything afterwards. So amazing for you. I know you have to go soon. I have one, well, two more very quick questions. I stump everybody on this one, even though people are like, geez, I should have thought of it. I know I'm not going to get you on it. What does it mean to you to be unbreakable? So obviously our brand is called I Am Unbreakable. And yes. you and I, I know wearing different badges of honor, we've gone through everything. What does it mean yeah. when you hear I Am Unbreakable? What does that mean to you? You know, when I first saw what you were doing and learned a little bit about you, you Adrian, and what you're were doing with this, I am unbreakable. I think the big thing for me is it is hard to do it alone, and I I do have there's some benefits. I, I I was I was born a certain way to be able to be a lot of my own cheerleader, which has been served me super well in my life. Um, but it made it even more important for people to be around me that could speak truth when I couldn't. Mm -hmm. And that I really feel that what has given me so much fuel in my life is surrounding myself with truth tellers. And that means that I'm authentic with them. I'm listening to what they're saying. I'm believing in them that they have my best interest at heart, which means you have to pick ones that do. Um, but it really that has a whole other podcast for another time, for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> yeah. no, it, it's the big contribution, I think, to me being able to say that is about having that like loving and supportive network. I find them everywhere. So, and that would be for you. And it goes back to our original and works perfectly with what we spoke about in the beginning with your single parent group is, yes. is yes. finding those connections, right? And having mm -hmm. the support throughout. But, you know, being authentic and being vulnerable at a time where it's tough is so super important. Thank you so much for your time. Last mm -hmm. closing question. Is there anything that you can share with us that you haven't that's up and coming or that we can watch out for? Obviously, lots of our community is going to follow you and see all the amazing things that you're doing. But is there anything that you want to share or that you can share right now? Or <laughs> have you given because you're doing a lot like you've shared a lot, especially with what you're doing with your company. But is there anything you can share further? You know, I, I think the, the, the closing thought I would leave is a less around Magna or me. And it's just the idea. I, I love what you're doing, Adrian. I think that these voices, it's really important for other women to hear them and leaders in general. Um, but I think the big thing is, and I think you nailed it at the beginning, it's this being personal is about being true to yourself, which means learn about yourself. Learn about who you are. Learn about the things that, like, where do you do well? And I, that network of people I have are also balanced for me. There are, I have blind spots, big, giant blind spots. Um, and I'm, the older I get, the more experience I have, the more I'm aware of them, the easier it is to find people that uh, can point them out for me. So I, I think that's the closing thought is love yourself and Learn about yourself as much as you can in that process. I love, and I hope that you and I will do another podcast because like I said, I've got so many things that I still need to ask you. I know we need to sign off. Thank you so much for all your time, all your amazing insight. And I know people are gonna love what you had to say. Thank you so much. Have an awesome day and enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you so much, Adrian. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, take care. Thank you. Chat soon. Bye. Bye.